uh, let us know your preferences. Look for the link on the listserv in the next couple of days. Even though we'll establish a regular meeting time, we'll definitely make exceptions for speakers who need to shift to a different time. We will still keep you posted on each upcoming webinar, no matter if it's part of a regular schedule or at a special time. Now for our webinar. The subject of today's webinar is the Community Engagement Fellows Program, which operates to support community engagement professionals in science. Our presenters today include the program director, Lou Woodley, who will give an overview of the program. You'll also hear the perspectives of Jen Davidson, who is one of the fellows. For some background, in addition to her role as director of the Community Engagement Fellows Program, Lou Woodley is the Community Engagement Director for Trellis, the new online communication and collaboration platform in development by the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Lou is a trained molecular biologist who has worked at the University of Cambridge, the European Molecular Biology Laboratory in Heidelberg, and the Center for Genomic Regulation in Barcelona. Since leaving the bench, she has gained extensive experience in on and offline community engagement. Jennifer Davidson is the program manager for Urban at UW, a cross-disciplinary and cross-sector sector initiative at the University of Washington that seeks to engage scholars and practitioners with the challenges that cities face, including homelessness, transportation issues, climate adaptation, and much more. Jen has a background in ecology and has spent years working with scientists to increase their effectiveness for communication, community engagement, and interdisciplinary collaboration. With respect to the Community Engagement Fellows Program, Jen's goal is to delight and demonstrate both the purpose of and best practices applied in community management to improve the effectiveness of Urban at UW and its projects. Welcome, Lou and Jen. Um, Hello. Um, okay. Hi, everyone. So, can you hear me now? Hopefully, now I'm muted. Thank you very much for the introduction, Karen. Uh, it's great to be here today. I'm uh, very excited to tell you about what we're building with the brand new AAAS Community Engagement Fellows Program, and then to dive a little bit deeper into the work of one of the project teams of the program. And Jen's going to be presenting some of the work that we've been doing as part of that project team. So, um, by way of background, you know, as Karen said, um, I wear two hats at AAAS. Uh, so, uh, I've been with AAAS for three and a half years now, and I started out there um, right when we launched the Trellis project. So, Trellis is the new online communication and collaboration platform that AAAS is building. So, I'm not going to talk about that much today. So, if you do want to know any more about Trellis, then please do feel free to reach out afterwards. Um, but the other hat that I wear is uh, as the program director for this new community engagement fellows program. That's obviously what we're going to focus on today. So uh, just by way of acknowledgement, uh, the program itself is funded with generous support from the Alpha P Sloan Foundation. And then the work that we're going to present later in this webinar to uh, characterize the role of the community engagement manager within science is being carried out by the C3 project team. So that's a subsection of the fellows on the community engagement fellows program. So that consists of Jen, who we're going to hear from, uh, Andy Lydolf, Malin Sandstrom, Alicia Woodcharlson, and myself. So we make up that project team. So in terms of how we're going to do the presentation today, uh, we're going to play tag team. So I'm going to start off um, and I want to cover four things. So I'm going to really start off with the basics and define what we mean by this term scientific community engagement and who we're referring to when we talk about scientific community engagement managers. Then I'm going to give you some information about a landscape survey that we did to really try and start understanding what scientific community engagement managers actually look like. You know, who are they? Where are they located? What do they do for their day jobs? Then I'm going to introduce the Community Engagement Fellows Programme. I'm going to tell you about what we've done so far in our pilot year. 
And then finally, I'm going to introduce you to our cohort of fellows. And so that'll be a nice segue through to handing over to Jen. Jen is, is one of the fellows in that initial cohort. And she's then going to talk about her experience of the fellowship and then dive a little deeper into the work that we've been doing as part of our C3 project team during the fellowship program. So I'm not a huge fan of giving monologues, so I'm extremely comfortable if you want to jump in and ask questions at any point. We are going to be covering a, a range of topics here, as you can see, so don't feel that you have to save all the questions up until the end. Feel free to, to interject if there's something that you want to discuss and go along. Okay, so let's start right at the beginning. Uh, what do we mean when we talk about scientific community engagement and, and this term community management? So this is really uh, what we consider to be an emerging role in the scientific sciences. And you know, another way of phrasing it is that it's the human infrastructure that's necessary for collaboration to take place. So a community engagement manager can be found in many different scenarios. And these are just four examples that are represented by some of the fellows on that I work on. So for example, fellows um, can be, associate, uh, be found within a professional association. So in this instance, this is the person that helps to build the relationship between the organization and the scientists that belong to, to that uh, association. They can be found within a local research context. So for example, Jen works um, on the Urban at UW project in Seattle, and that's really all about bringing together local communities, local stakeholders to work on collaborative projects. Community engagement managers can also be found on the statewide or national level. So this week I'm out in Utah. Um, I'm shadowing one of our fellows who is part of an NSF EBSCOR project. Uh, and he's really looking at a statewide water sustainability challenges. And then um, a community engagement managers can also operate internationally. So uh, Malin, who's on our project team, she is a community engagement manager for the INCF. That's an international neuroinformatics coordinating facility. And that's really about creating standards uh, and bringing together uh, folks in the neurosciences to, to really help them work across various different projects uh, in a way uh, that ensures that they're standardizing their, their work. Was that a question or is that just background noise? Okay, I will carry on. So another way that we think about our community engagement managers is that they're, they're almost the, the glue that enables produ productive collaboration to take place within their community. And when we use this word community, what we're really referring to is in-reach rather than outreach. So we're not talking about public engagement. We're not talking about taking science out to the community in terms of the public. We're talking about enabling people who are working together on a team-based project to do so in an effective way. And so like I say, that may be between an association and its members, that may be between diverse stakeholders within a, a local context, a regional context, or even uh, a research collaboration operating into nationally. Now we can also think about um, community engagement managers in um, you know various other ways you know we can plot them out in various different axes and for this pilot year of the program we're being deliberately broad about this spectrum you know we, we suspect that there is a, a, a whole range of, of uh, different roles in this, this spectrum of, of people carrying out community engagement and they might be found within different organizational contexts so there's a big difference between folks who are working within a professional association and those that are working on a research collaboration. They can be operating at different geographical scales, as I've already talked about, and they can even be operating with different disciplinary foci. So uh, some of them may be uh, just focusing on a single discipline, others may be going all the way to transdisciplinary activities. And then of course, depending on the organizational context and the project context, they can be operating under different funding models as well. So really part of what we're trying to understand uh, in this initial year is um, what exactly do all these folks look like? You know, if we were going to draw out this spectrum and we were going to understand all of the various different people that we could put into this bucket that we call community engagement managers, um, what would they be and, and what are the various different differences between them? And then how can we support this role? You know, is there a common curriculum, a common skill set, a common set of learnings that would be really useful to, to make sure that this really important role uh, is actually supported? So 
This is an, um, you know, community engagement may be an, an emerging field within science. It's something that, that we're only really talking about in, in recent years. And obviously, it's not just us talking about this. You know, science and team science as a, as a broader movement has been thinking about this for some time. Um, folks as part of this interreach community are thinking about a very specific type of, of community engagement manager found within a, a very particular configuration. But if you zoom out and you look beyond science, you can see that community management is already a, a discipline that's recognised beyond that. So it really is something that grew up um, out of the, the tech industry. And so in a corporate context, it typically performs what I would describe as an engagement function. So it allows an organization to have some kind of relationship with uh, the end users, with people that they want to collaborate with. So that could be anything from providing online support forums, places for you to actually give feedback about a product. It could be a place for you to have discussion about um, particular activities, or it could even go to the level of, of communities working together to curate content. And then in some scenarios, what you see is that um, these, these types of uh, communities can also um, be uh, involved in co-creation activities. So organizations such as Linux, for example, that had one of the, the very first publicly recognized community managers, John O'Bacon, they're an open source community. It's extremely collaborative collaborative. Uh, it's very much focused on working with community members to, to continue to, to iterate that code and build it together um, in, a, in a very shared way. Uh, Lego as well, you know, this is another example of one of these online communities where that the organization builds a relationship with, with the customers and enables them to have input into the product development process and, and suggest new toy, toys that they may want to build. So with these community managers outside of science, what you typically see with them is that they have both online and offline roles. So it's fairly common now to see that um, there are online platforms cropping up around various different organizations, around various different products. But it's also common to see that people are being convened in person, often at, at conferences, at workshops, at special events that these organizations put on. And that's no surprise because as we all know from personal experience, it's a lot easier to, to build deeper relationships when you actually have face-to-face -face time uh, with people. And, and that's so the same uh, when you're working in this general community management context. And then finally, I just wanted to underline that there's an increasing body of research and professional support in this community management field in general. So I'm not going to dive uh, too much into the literature, but I just wanted to um, flag up some of the, the resources that are available for community managers in general. So there's a growing number of books about this field. So you can read all about the theory of community management. You can look at things like uh, four stages of a community life cycle and, and what online communities look like. Uh, you can look at um, how it is that you can um, organize the communications for your community, how you moderate so that you see good behavior and, and things like that. There are various organizations that are providing community consultancy. So uh, there's just a few of them listed here. Again, none of these are specific to the sciences. So these are all operating very much within the corporate sector. And then finally, as I mentioned, um, many of these consultancies and, and some ad hoc organizations are actually convening events as well. And so the idea here is to start bringing the community managers who are running these communities together in person to um, start getting training and, and swapping resources about what it is to successfully build communities. So one of the organizations that I, I flagged up is the Community Roundtable and these are based out of Boston and have been working for at least seven years now in the corporate community management space. And the reason that I flagged them up is that they've been uh, taking an interesting approach to community management because they've been also focusing on the research perspective and really trying to understand what corporate community managers look like. So they've been carrying out a state of community management survey every year. Um, now, and that's resulted in a state of community management report that they produce. Plus, they also do a biannual salary survey. And as a result of doing these surveys to, to better understand what community managers look like, they've come up with this skills wheel, which describes five broad skills families that corporate community managers have. So they have engagement skills, content skills, strategic, business, and technical skills. And so these are the different colors uh, that you see here on the wheel. And then what you can do is dive a little deeper um, into any one of these top level skills. And you can see some of the activities that community managers carry out 
uh, within those skills. So for example, uh, if you dive down into content skills, that can break out into things like writing, editing, curation of content, uh, event planning, and more. So this was kind of a, an interesting background when we started thinking about scientific community managers and, and kind of wondering whether they could be characterized by these same broad buckets or whether maybe something was missing here. And so what we did is we started to think about exploring community management within science is that we reached out to the community round table uh, and we decided to work with them to repurpose their survey that they send out every year and to reuse some of the questions um, that they send out to the corporate community managers, make some edits to those to make them a little more relevant to scientific community managers, and then send that survey around to start trying to understand what community management within science looked like. So what we ended up with was a survey of around 70 questions. It was a conditional survey, so you didn't necessarily end up having to answer all 70. And it took about 15 minutes to get through from start to finish. Um, we shared that survey around our network. So we had mailing lists of, of various folks that were interested in, in what we were doing. We publicized this on social media, on Trellis, on the Trellis blog, uh, with the AAAS affiliates and so on, to, to really try and get a, a diverse input of various people working in this space. And so we asked them lots of questions about what it is that they actually did, how they were funded, the challenges they were facing, and so on. So we left this um, open, the, the data collection um, that we've analysed covers the period from May to August of last year. Uh, we've got over 100 responses and 69 of those are people that were self-identified community engagement professionals. So these are really people um, that when they filled in the survey and, and the survey asked, you know, do you have somebody within your organisation who is the community manager? And they said yes. And said, is that person you? They were the ones that, that self-identified as doing that. So the other um, 30 or so people that, that have filled in this survey are people that work within an organization that, that um, probably has a community manager, but they weren't the person doing the role. So what did we learn? Well, first of all, in terms of the, the people that filled the survey in, you'll see that there's a, a fairly even split, you know, approximately a quarter of people were located within professional societies and associations. And then um, approximately a quarter of people are located in collaborations of more than one research group. Um, the next uh, biggest category is people that are located within higher education institutions. Institutes, um, and then there's a mix uh, down below of things like other non-profit organizations and, and informal communities some of those are volunteer communities of practice so we're really looking at this um, in terms of what things look like in with within professional associations and then what things look like within some kind of research collaboration context so when we then dive down a bit further, um, we say, who are these scientific community managers? You know, how did they get there and, and what is their training? So of the 69 people who self-identified as, as community engagement managers, 56 of them had scientific training in their background. So that's by far the majority. And of those, most of them had PhDs. So this wasn't surprising. This matched what we suspected and, and what we'd seen from the people that we already knew. Um, it doesn't really matter what context you're carrying out community engagement within science, typically having some cultural awareness of, of how science works, of the challenges that are facing science and of being able to, to speak the language as it were when you're engaging with your community are an important background to, to have when entering into this role. However, when you actually look at the job titles of people in this role, there's a huge range of diversity. And so this really reflects the fact that this isn't something um, that has really uh, been accepted as a, as a profession yet. Um, because there's a, a lot of uh, variation in, in the, the, the roles. It's everything from uh, more academic titles, things like assistant VP of, of research development, down to uh, things like communication specialists, um, community strategists, community advocate, and more. So while some of the, the people, like 19% here you see, are, are identifying as community managers, actually the biggest category is other, and that's when you know that you certainly haven't hit on the right term uh, with your survey options. So in terms of then what exactly uh, these folks do, we, we asked whether or not they were spending all of their job doing community engagement activities or whether they were in a hybrid role where they considered that they were doing additional activities as well. And so what you actually see is that um, many of the folks um, are in 
full-time roles. Um, and then 80% um, of them have additional non-engagement responsibilities. So um, it, it, there's certainly some lack of clarity, I think, with this shows about what exactly classes as community engagement. I mean, we, we dug down a little bit further in the survey, which I won't show here, about exactly the kind of activities that, that people were doing. Um, and certainly they don't necessarily class all of the, the communication and the outreach activities as, as part of, of that engagement role. We also found there's a lot of flexibility with these roles. Um, what's interesting is that uh, there's a fairly even split between uh, folks that are able to uh, work remotely and those that aren't. Uh, so it, it seems that uh, certainly when you get to uh, a certain level of experience with this role, it is actually possible to, to carry it out at a location remote to where your community is located. And this actually reflects something that the Community Roundtable have, have also found, that you don't always need to be co-located with your community, especially if it's an online community that you're managing. Okay, so one of the next things we wanted to find out was what support do scientific community engagement managers receive? And so... Um, one of the things that we were uh, diving a little deeper on was what kind of professional development opportunities are available to scientific community managers. And the answer is right now, not very many. So 58% uh, of the community engagement managers in our survey said that they were uh, learning on the job, i.e. they were mostly self-taught. So there isn't, um, or there wasn't when we did the survey, uh, an opportunity to go through any kind of training program for this. Um, and it's really a lot about uh, professional development on the job. And the next category along was you know, reading books, blogs, uh, tapping into professional networks. And only 9% of people had a mentor within the same organization who was actually helping them within the role. And so what you also get from this is that this can actually be quite a lonely role. You can often find that you're the only one within your organization who is carrying out this function. And if you don't know other people at all, organizations doing it and it can be very difficult to find uh, where where to get advice from if you're encountering encountering problems with your work or, or just where to learn and um, how to develop in your role and so that was really one of the motivations for, for launching the community engagement fellows program is to, to help to train that and to provide support for people in this vital human infrastructure role in terms of the funding environment um 86 percent of the the community managers in our survey were in paid positions so only a small segment of them were actually doing this as, as a volunteer role and the funding in the role really was very reflective of the type of organization that they worked for. lunch with mom and then we'll go Did you hear that uh... hi if you're not talking I'm sorry if you're not the presenter please yeah. mute because we can hear you yeah. Great. So, um, yes, so we, we also asked about funding for the role, and we really found that this correlated with the type of organisation that the community manager worked for. So, unsurprisingly, if you were working for an association, then you tended to have uh, funding guaranteed indefinitely. That was, you know, as long as the role is going to persist within the organisation, as long as the project is, is being prioritised, then, then that role was guaranteed. Whereas roles associated within the research collaboration context, unsurprisingly, are tracking the grant cycle. And so the amount of funding left was somewhere between one and five years, depending on where they were in that cycle. So what we asked then next, and bear in mind, this is only really a very small snapshot of some of the survey results, just to highlight some of the trends in what we saw. We asked about the, the skill sets of community managers. So you remember that I showed you the Community Roundtable skills wheel and the, the five broad skills families that the Community Roundtable had identified. Well, as a starting point, we asked community engagement managers in science how they rated those particular skills. And so somewhat unsurprisingly, they also rated uh, the engagement family of skills as being the most important for them carrying out their role. So this directly reflects the community roundtable survey results for 2016, which are shown down the bottom in the donut, uh, which also showed that, that engagement skills were most important. And next was strategic and content. So that's actually uh, flipped with the community roundtable, it's content and strategic, but they're still the, the same top three skills. And then um, somewhat unsurprisingly, I, I guess, and this is partly a, a question of, of terminology and, and possibly a question of diving into more detail of what the actual skills are the business skills are the most lowly ranked for scientific community engagement professionals so um, most don't identify with these as, as being something that's really core to the day-to-day the -day functions that they're carrying out 
And then finally, we asked what are the current challenges that scientific community engagement managers are facing? And a third of res the respondents in the survey said that prioritizing the number of tasks to do is their greatest challenge. So this really resonated with us because it, it's often heard from community managers that you're really juggling a, a lot of different things and you're juggling them on everything from a micro all the way up to a macro level. So you can be really down in the weeds sometimes, really helping facilitate things on a, a very detail oriented level. And then the next moment, be stepping back and thinking very strategically about the funding or the future direction of your community or all the topics that that community wants to address. So prioritization of tasks is a, is a really big challenge. The next thing uh, reflected this um, notion of, of community managers not necessarily always being a full time role yet. This is often a, sh a shared role where it's got the hybrid responsibilities. And so um, people were saying that that is often also a challenge because they're obviously having to juggle uh, various different tasks on their to do lists. So that's just a really, really quick snapshot of what we found on the survey. We dive a lot uh, deeper on the Trellis blog if you want to go and read more uh, about that. So that's blog.trellisscience.com slash tag slash survey results. And that will pull up all the blog posts that we have uh, about this diving uh, a bit deeper. And then there's some more analysis in that where we, we discuss the results as well. So that really, uh, carrying out this landscape survey then, it, it really crystallised for us that there are definitely community engagement managers operating in various different contexts within science. Um, they're definitely uh, in need of professional development support. And this really is a nascent profess profession. You know, this isn't something that, that has a clear, clear career path at the moment. Um, and, and it isn't something that therefore is necessarily getting the, the support um, or even the, the funding, um, um, given how important we perceived it to be. So this really led us to then putting together the plan for the AAAS Community Engagement Fellows Programme, which launched in January this year. And again, you can read a little bit more about that, both on the AAAS website and also on the Trellis blog. So the programme itself, the, the goals of the grant are to professionalise and institutionalise the role of the scientific community engagement manager. And um, for our pilot year, we decided to focus on two particular contexts in which scientific community engagement managers are found. So the first of those is within associations and the second is within research collaboration. So this was really just to give us some level of, of focus. But what's actually been interesting, is, as I'll show you and as, as Jen will talk about with, with some of our project team work, this is a slightly naive assumption because actually it really is a, a spectrum. It really is a continuum where these roles um, almost merge into each other as you go along the spectrum and they're, they're not necessarily absolutely clearly de delineated or at least that's not what we found so far. So in, in terms of delivering on the grant then, what, what does that practically look like uh, to professionalise and institutionalise this role? So firstly, it's to gain a better understanding of the professional landscape for scientific engagement managers. So the survey results really feed into that and then um, getting to know the, the fellows in, in more detail throughout the duration of the programme uh, is obviously a very important component of that as well. The second thing that we wanted to do was to provide professional development training and resource sharing for an initial cohort. And so we wanted to devise um, what we believe is the first ever curriculum for scientific community engagement professionals. Um, that was a, a week long program that was delivered in January when all the fellows started. But we also recognise that uh, many of these uh, people have actually also put together their own resources. They've learned a lot on the job by doing their roles. And so we really wanted to create a forum where they could share with one another. So this idea of forming a cohort was very deliberate of, of encouraging that, that space to, to share among the members and was really key to, to the programme's success. So we really wanted to, to help them to uh, feel supported by AAAS, but also supported by each other so that we had this safe space for, for knowledge sharing. Then um, fourth on the list, we wanted to help the fellows to demonstrate the value of community building back to their organisation. So one of the ch challenges when you have a nascent role, and especially in a role like this, where often if you're being really effective at your job, it, it's not always clear that, that you're doing the things that you're doing. You know, if, if the collaboration or the, the community that you're building is, is running very smoothly, then it's not often visible um, all the work that the, the community engagement manager is doing to, to help 
um, facilitate that occurring. And so we wanted to, to give the fellows a language and give them some uh, strategy and, and some models that they could then take back to their organisations to, to help codify what they do. Um, we, fifth on the list, wanted to create opportunities for co-creation among the cohort members. So this is really where the project teams come in, and Jen's going to talk a little bit more about those but essentially the cohort split out into four different self-selected teams so they picked particular topics um, that were top of their mind uh, in community engagement right now and then defined some things that they wanted to dive into in a little bit more detail uh, and explore together over the course of the year uh, benefiting from each other's perspectives uh, in, in what they've done in their role so far. And then finally, we obviously want to demonstrate that the programme's been valuable in helping the, the fellows to become more effective at their own roles. And so we have an external evaluator who's been working with us right from the beginning of the programme, and, and she's obviously tracking the, the progress of the fellows um, and um, how that maps also to the, the hopes of the host organisations uh, when the fellows started to, to see whether the fellows really are getting better as a result of participating in the programme. So in terms of what this programme looks like, uh, as I said, it's a, it's a year-long programme. So it started in January. We recruited all the, the fellows at the end of, of last year and then uh, we brought them all together in DC at, at AAAS in January for a week's worth of training. And that was really to kick the year off and, and to provide a common grounding in uh, community engagement. It was to build that sense of cohort that's then uh, persisting throughout the year. Um, and it was to uh, make sure that they had um, actionable learnings that they could then take back to their day jobs at their host organizations. So most of the fellows, um, all bar one was already located within a job. Um, so they were already acting as scientific community engagement managers. They just um, obtained permission to participate in the program throughout the year. So they come along in January for a week, uh, they get this training and then they go back to their host organization and continue their day job. Uh, but now with the support of the cohort, with the support of the program and with the, the learnings and the, the language that they've picked up as part of the training. So the way we structured this week in January was um, to have a different theme for each day of the training week and then to work during the day through various different topics on that particular theme. So we started out with um, community engagement in general and then went specific into um, what that looks like within science. We then spent a whole day thinking about community engagement strategy. We spent another day diving down into content. Um, we spent uh, another day in the week thinking about engagement and team working and, and communication and we actually had the, the toolbox dialogue initiative come and, and facilitate a, um, one of our workshops as part of that, that set of communication exercises. And then we very intentionally introduced the, the ideas of the importance of organisational culture and then the importance on a, an individual level of self-care at being able to be an effective community engagement manager. So one of the things that's really key about this role, you know, I already mentioned the fact that um, folks in this role can often feel quite isolated. They can often feel that they're the only one in their organization doing what they do. They can also often feel quite overwhelmed. You know, there's a lot of task switching, a lot of wearing of different hats within their organization. And um, if you're also coupled with that, trying to constantly justify your role because nobody's quite sure exactly what it is that you do, then that can obviously be a recipe for burnout. And so we wanted to specifically address the fact that it wouldn't necessarily be a simple case of taking the learnings from January, going back to the organization and suddenly everything is gonna be fine, uh, that we really had to, to um, name the challenges that are, are associated with the roles so that we could continue to address them throughout the year. So in addition to, to those themes that we explored, we also set aside um, time during that week to get to know one another. So all of the fellows presented lightning talks. That was a very important part of, of having them uh, present who they were and, and the projects that they're working on. We had reflection sessions every afternoon. Um, and this was really vital for letting the fellows digest and, and synthesize the activities that had taken place earlier in the day. So I think we're all very well aware of what it's like to go to a great conference, be incredibly stimulated by the materials there, and then get back to to the day job a couple of days later and a colleague comes in and says so you know what was covered at the conference and, and your head's just swirling with all the various different inputs that you haven't actually had time to, to 
go through you haven't necessarily had time to to format your notes or, or bring together the core themes so we wanted very intentionally to give the fellows the opportunity to do this every afternoon throughout that week so that we could then reflect individually come back as a, as a group and, and see what the group learnings were, were from that and then develop individual development plans for the year based on the particular things of relevance to to each fellow um, that they were, were picking up throughout the training week and then there are obviously a couple of social activities to you know there's nothing like trying to uh, collaboratively escape from a room uh, to, to find out what people's skill sets are and, and to get to know each other better uh, and a couple of dinners to continue the conversations going um, and then as I've already mentioned the, the fellows formed into project teams for ongoing work throughout the year as well so that all took place in January everybody went back to their, their day job for, for five months we have monthly webinars where we've been then checking in so that there continues to be a, a point of contact between the fellows and in those webinars what we've been exploring is the creation of community playbooks so these are really a way of codifying the activities of a community engagement manager such that you can communicate them to your colleagues. So a playbook really consists of various different elements. It's things like uh, the vision for the community that you're building, whether that's a research collaboration or whether that's a, a community of, of scientists that your association is having a, a relationship with. Um, that includes diving down into things like the tools landscape. So what mechanisms do you use to have the conversations as part of your collaboration? You know, this might be a uh, monthly all hands meeting uh, where, where everybody gets together and shares their, their research data. This could be a weekly webinar series. This could be a series of blog posts. This could be um, an annual meeting. It could be various different things, but, but thinking you know, very specifically about the tools and the locations in which uh, you can have uh, the conversations with your members and, and who's managing those various different channels. And then right down to, to other items such as what your content and engagement strategies look like. And so codifying all this into a playbook was a really key way to make sure that all of the fellows have a, a deliverable that they can take back to their organisations at the end of the fellowship year and say, you know, even if everything on my particular project hasn't gone to plan, we've now managed to actually characterize what we're doing with our community specifically. And so um, more people within the organization can understand the role and, and maybe even some of those responsibilities can, can be shared or, or at least covered more easily when folks go out on vacation and so on. So that's been happening via these monthly webinars um, that have been taking place uh, between the in-person get-togethers. And then uh, we got together a few weeks ago in June for our mid-year meeting, and that was just a couple of days. Um, and this is really the pivot point of the year. So unsurprisingly, the fellows all extremely enthusiastic from the, the training materials that they'd received in January, went back to their organizations. And then, you know, the, the reality begins to bite that it's not always easy to implement change within an organization. It's not always easy to implement new processes is new models for doing things and so uh, we very intentionally made the mid-year meeting about thinking about organizational theory thinking about systems thinking some of the barriers to change within organizations and how it is that we can work with those in our roles as community engagement managers that so was an incredibly rich meeting re really uh, productive couple of days where we, we dive deep on a, a lot of these issues and then in lightning talks again the fellows themselves were reporting back on the success Successes and challenges that they'd encountered so far. So we dived into case studies of particular items that they'd learnt in January that they'd then gone and implemented at their organisation. So we had some great success stories of, of people building out content strategies or, or people doing audits of the various activities that their, their collaborations were involved with. Um, and then we had some very honest reflections on challenges encountered and, and a lot of uh, supporting one another as a cohort in terms of um, brainstorming ideas as, as to how to go back and address those challenges we also had a workshop that's what the picture on the right here shows that's uh, folks continuing to work on the community playbook so thinking about um, how we actually develop those materials and, and start getting um, some of that written down and then we had an additional day where the project teams were able to, to dive deeper into the work that they're doing uh, and to, to take advantage of the, the FaceTime and the fact that they're all in the same location to, to continue their project work. So we're going to hear a bit more about that from Jen in a moment. And then finally, um, obviously, uh, nice segue then to, to introducing Jen, one of our fellows. What actually does this inaugural cohort look like? 
Uh, so let me tell you a little bit more about the class of 2017. So we have 19 fellows, we have 17 of whom are funded through the Sloan grant, and then we have two community managers on my team at AAAS who um, are also participating in the program. Uh, one of those manages our internal AAAS communities, so that's um, where AAAS programs and so on are, are building um, relationships, and also where AAAS now has brought all 105,000 members onto um, our Trellis platform. Uh, so she's been working to, to uh, start to get to know our members better through that platform. And then the other community manager is working with um, our external users, so folks who are bringing their own communities onto Trellis and, and looking to bring um, those projects to the platform and they often need some help and support um, and training in uh, community management because they've not necessarily done this before. So um, reflecting the survey results that I presented back to you, the fellows backgrounds are all unsurprisingly mostly in science. So of the 19 fellows, 17 of them are scientists by training and two obviously then non-scientists. Seven of them have got PhDs, so again highly educated, highly specialised and eight of them have got masters, uh, two of which are are not in the sciences so uh, they really uh, most of them have got that scientific background which reflects the survey results and then pleasingly uh, for our, our very first year we are an international class so uh, it's not just fellows from the US we've got uh, people participating from Sweden from Iceland from the UK and then there's a diversity across the US as well so we go all the way out from Hawaii all the way back over to DC via Utah Texas Wisconsin and more so uh, it's a really nice range uh, of different projects. And then what you can see here is a really broad range of different organizations as well. So uh, you remember that I said that we were focusing on two broad buckets, uh, the professional associations and then uh, people within the research collaboration context. So some of the uh, professional associations are things like the American Society of Agronomy, uh, we've got Society of Petroleum Engineers, uh, we've got the New York Academy of Sciences taking part. And then at the research collaboration level, we've got things like uh, IUTAR, the, the EPS, NSF EPS School Project, um, and we've got the Deep Carbon Observatory, um, which is another Sloan funded project, which is looking at, at building out um, a brand new discipline uh, for carbon scientists. So uh, we're really pleased with the diversity of, of uh, organisations that are represented in this first year as well. And then this is just another way of thinking about um, how those fellows map. So this is just mapping them out on two different axes. So this is a, a chart that one of our fellows, Andy, um, drew up. And it basically shows uh, the geographical reach of the communities that the fellows are working with. So everything from the local level right at the bottom all the way up to the, the global level at the top against the disciplinary reach of the communities that they're working with. So everything from single disciplines all the way through to transdisciplinary. And so Andy started off, first of all, by placing himself here. So he's working on a, a statewide project. Uh, it's all about uh, water sustainability in Utah. Um, and that's, he says, sort of verging into the, the transdisciplinary realm. And then if we put um, some of the rest of the fellows onto the graph, we can see that we've got people who are working within the scientific associations. Some of those are associations that are just focusing on a single discipline. So remember like agronomy society, petroleum engineers, plant sciences, developmental biology. And some of them are working across various different disciplines. So uh, we've got you know, concerned scientists, we've got New York Academy of Sciences, you know, they're not necessarily just focused on, on one particular subject. And then down the bottom, we've got the folks supporting the local research collaborations, but again, that spans the, the range of disciplinary scales. Um, and we've also got fellows who are interested in open science as well. So, uh, you know, that's interesting to see that, that community building and, and open fairly unsurprisingly have, have some synergies. Uh, and then we've got uh, fellows who are working on uh, global research networks. So uh, Malin is, is the fellow that's working at the INCF that, that I introduced. Um, and, and we've got uh, Alan and Katie here working on uh, international collaborations. So almost ready to hand over to Jen now. She's going to talk through what it's like to uh, be a fellow and the, the work that we've been doing to characterise the roles and the skill sets of scientific community engagement managers as part of our C3 project team. But I just wanted to say that if you're interested in diving a little bit deeper into to any of these topics around what we call community engagement and community management, you're very welcome to request to join the C4Sci group 
on Trellis. So Trellis is currently in an invite only period, but if you go to this URL, so trellisscience.com slash C4Sci, you'll see a box on the page. You can just pop your email address in there and then I'll get back to you with an invite to the group and you can dive in. It's free to participate. You can um, see various conversations that we have about the challenges of community building, you know, everything from onboarding strategies to interesting podcasts and, and blog posts that we've been reading recently. Um, and then finally, I just want to end and say, if anybody has any questions about what I've presented, I'm, I'm happy to take a few quick questions now um, before we hand over to Jen. Hi, Lou. This is uh, Christine Hendren. Um, if it's okay, I'll just ask a quick question. Sure, please do. Yep. Um, so I always enjoy your presentations. That was really fantastic. Um, and so interesting to see uh, the parallels between what you're talking about, which I realize is a large part of my role, actually. Mm. And some yep. of the other um, ways that we have sliced up roles within the interreach community, which we purposely named as um, a, a kind of an intersectional group of people that might have different types of roles with these similar skills. Um, I wonder, because I'm thinking, wow, this is similar to some other things, um, such as the um, research development professionals that uh, Holly and others yep. created Nord out of, it's similar to the IES role that uh, talked yep. about. Gabrielle's I2S, um, I, but yours is the first that has uh, garnered, you know, a AAAS governmental support of a, a, a training and purposeful program such as this. Um, am I right about that assumption that you, this is the kind of the first foray into that avenue of um, pulling together and developing teaching and training around it? Yeah, I mean, we certainly believe that to be true. So unless anybody can point out uh, other things elsewhere, you know, we, this is the first curriculum for scientific community engagement managers that we know of. And as it, you know, it's been exciting and wonderful to put it together. Together. I also want to say that it is very much the pilot year. So it's been fantastic to get lots of very useful feedback from our fellows who you know, typically have found it extremely useful because as, as you can see from the survey results, there's very, very little professional development opportunities out there for people in these roles. But that's not to say that we've got everything covered yet. So it's an interesting space to, to continue to explore and also continue to, to explore in terms of how to slice and dice it. You know, we, we for this first year, put, put the entire cohort of fellows together. You know, we didn't track anything. We didn't say, well, you know, this bit is probably more relevant to research collaborations and this bit is maybe more relevant to associations. We deliberately put everybody in together as a cohort um, and, and then said, you know, give us your feedback about which bits resonated uh, best for you, what we've missed and, and so on. So it's definitely lots of conversations to continue having there about, um, you know, wh where we can go next with that curriculum. Um, but just to follow up, because that, uh, that, uh, this is so novel, um, uh, the way that it's being approached, was this initiated from um, top down or bottom up, I guess, is the short way to ask that? Or who, who was able to see, okay, this is a need and let's create a funded program? So I would say this was one of those wonderful moments of synergy when things all come together at the same time, but you know, when it happens, it's magic. So we were thinking about this anyway. I mean, community management is very much my background. So before I joined AAAS, I spent five years at Nature Publishing Group and really very interested in the first wave of online collaboration tools for scientists and then what it meant to, to convene uh, community conversations, as we called them, with um, the various stakeholders within within science and within knowledge sharing. So, you know, I was very used to bringing together uh, people interested in science policy and public engagement in, in technology innovation to think about what it meant to disseminate knowledge within science. And so, I've been geeking out about this for some years. And so, when when I then sort of moved over to to uh, 
triple S and, and to work on Trellis, you know, one of the, the emphases that we had right up front is we said, well, okay, we can build this platform. You know, we can really focus on the technology, but the technology alone is not going to be enough. You know, the, the, the sort of old saying, you know, if you build it, they will come. Well, it's just not true. You know, you, you can't just, just put a platform out there and, and think, that without any kind of uh, nurturing and human infrastructure that a, a collaboration is going to be successful. So right from the off, this emphasis on community management and on supporting the group admins who are going to be running the groups on Trellis was, was really a key part of our strategy. So we, we were planning on developing a lot of these materials anyway, and then we ended up having a conversation with Sloan, who were also thinking along similar lines, and they say that came together perfectly, resulting in, in this uh, fellowship programme and the, the training materials that we've developed today. Thank you for that. That's a really interesting model and I know one we can all learn from. Okay, that's all I will ask. Thanks. Anybody else have any quick questions before we hand over to Jen? Okay, Jen. Great. Um, can everyone, um, I'm hoping you can see my screen. Yep. Um, excellent. Thank you. All right. So I get the opportunity to talk about the a Community Engaged Fellows Program um, from my perspective as a, co a cohort member and also talk to you a little bit about the project that I'm, the project team that I'm on and the project that we're working on to kind of understand uh, science community managers or uh, community engagement managers um, in context. So I'm the one on the left, the little yellow circle around my head, one of 19. Um, and as uh, Lou mentioned, I work at University of Washington um, at, oops, sorry, at uh, Urban at UW, which is a cross-disciplinary research uh, group that actually is a, a center that um, is cross, across not only science disciplines, but the design disciplines and um, uh, social science and humanities as well, so quite broad. Um, and so the reason that I uh, wanted to apply, well, the three, um, sorry, apologies, three um, topics I'll, I'll walk through today is why I applied to CEFP and um, my experience so far and, and how that has affected my work, and then dive a little into the project team's work to characterize community management in science. So why I applied to CEFP, so I, as, as Lou mentioned, I'm one of those folks who, um, in this role, I feel a bit isolated. There are maybe a few people on campus at University of Washington who do similar work to myself, um, staff, usually research scientists or other staff who are charged with <clears throat> hurting the cats of, of bringing uh, researchers together to collaborate on projects. And in my case, um, oftentimes these projects are not yet uh, funded. They're not yet even um, uh, identified. So bringing people together to help them identify the things they have in common and then to overcome the barriers to do their research together. So I was feeling quite isolated in my role. It's not very common as we know in ac academia. Um, to find interdisciplinary um, support for interdisciplinary work and, and the kind of infrastructural uh, background for that. So I, can't, I wanted to be a part of the, the fellowship program, not only to identify and refine uh, key skills and, um, and best practices for this work, which I knew were out there, but I wasn't really sure how to, it just seemed like it just falls across a lot of different disciplines and a lot of different um, fields. I also wanted to find a community of practice, um, a group of people who are doing the same things as me, who are interested in the same topics, who are trying to figure it out, and who were also dealing with the same challenges and overcoming them in different ways. And then finally, to I wanted was really interested, and I still am really interested in developing both an evidence base and a narrative to talk about this work, to explain how it um, adds value, and to and to advocate for this role so that we can all be more effective and we can be funded. <laughs> um, so that's uh, why I was, I applied and was really psyched that I got in. And um, so my experience thus far is really a court of, sort of kind of meta. Um, I found a community of community managers. And um, so I've been able to, through, through the, both the programming and the cohort itself, um, I've 
gained access to new concepts and theories around community management, which I was not familiar with the term community management before this, uh, um, co this, this fellowship. I saw myself as a program manager, which is my title. Um, but I wasn't really familiar with the literature around this and, and the, and the practice around this. So new concepts around community management, including everything from this idea of a community life cycle and, the, and, and ways to, um, uh, um, leverage different points in the life cycle in order to, um, create value uh, all the way to how, how to, in general, how to help communities and science communities specifically to add measurable value to, to an organization. So I also am finding really actionable ideas and practices that I have been able to take back to my program. Um, things like um, building a community playbook. So that it's a huge topic in and of itself, but um, digging into developing codes of conduct and shared values and um, mapping the maturity of the community and identifying, you know, uh, goals and objectives for each of those um, the, the, those levels and, and then really <clears throat> basically a work plan uh, that is both public, uh, it can be either public and or internal, um, to really sp very grounded uh, uh, practices like different methods for facilitating meetings and facilitating collaborations. A lot of the stuff that we saw at the Science of Team Science, for example, which I was able to go to that conference this year, um, is also some of the stuff that we cover, we've been covering in this um, this uh, fellowship. And then finally, as I mentioned, uh, I'm finding a, I found a new community. These are my people. It was the first time in a while that I've gone to a professional gathering and felt like, oh, what I'm doing is not, I'm not the only one who's doing this. Um, so both the, the jobs that people are doing and the skills that they have to leverage and the way in which we have to leverage them, this kind of multitasking, many, many hats um, uh, experience, as well as uh, some really interesting similar personality traits or characteristics of really common kind of um, systems thinking and um, a real kind of paying attention to uh, relationship. And so really kind of coming away so far feeling like, oh, I am a community manager. Not only am I a community manager, I am a, a change agent. Um, so I just want to make sure that I'm seeing that there's some stuff on the chat. Um, oh, okay. Anyway, um, what's that? So now I'm going to jump into um, what our project uh, team is doing within the, the fellowship. And our project, project team is called Catalyzing Cultural Change. Um, but I'll talk about the other uh, goals first, just kind of introduce you to the other project. Um, so the four project teams within the program um, are titled as such, uh, content on content. So really focused on how we can develop relevant and effective content. So that mean, meaning everything from press releases to blog posts to social media to events um, and uh, agendas and anything content based <laughs> to engage and support science communities. Um, the Advocacy Ninjas project team is focused, focused on creating effective advocacy, mentorship, and other um, programs within their science communities to kind of um, mobilize and, and, and add value. The so Solutions for Tackling Engagement Evaluation from Metrics to Impact, or STEMI uh, group, uh, is focusing on ways to measure impact of science communities, so really trying to get at that quantification piece to help help us describe what, what uh, science communities do and help us to add value by adding numbers. Um, and then our group, which is uh, C3, Catalyzing Cultural Change. So we're looking at the different models of science community managers within in context, in their organizational context, and um, their effectiveness in creating cultural change to support the science community goals. <clears throat> and I'm gonna dive into that now. So our team is made up of the people with the yellow circles around their heads. Um, and so most, many of us are um, involved in science collaborations. And these teams were self-selected. Um, and we were all interested in uh, really understanding how can we make 
are, how can we be more effective? And what are the ways in which um, where we're placed within the organization, the skills that we uh, use or the, the, the tasks that we um, have to, that we're responsible for, the connections that we have within our organization and within the, com the science community, how do those play out in terms of us being able to create change in order to help the science community achieve its goals? And in most cases, but not all in this conversation, um, those, those goals have to do with scientific collaboration just with this team, but we're looking at the, the larger community engagement, uh, community engaged managers uh, landscape as the cohort, or the, sorry, as the fellowship has defined it. So the questions that we're looking at are, um, in general, what are the knowledge, core competencies, skills, and personality traits that, um, that fall across the broad range of community managers, science community managers, that are both sought after in terms of like when, when you're applying for that job, what are, you, what are you being asked to do, as well as what you're actually doing when you're in the job, um, what is being used and what is actually needed. And we, and we are finding pretty quickly that those are overlapping, but they're not exactly the same. And then secondly, what are the institutional organizational roles and functions within, you know, around this each community manager um, that, that, that have to do with seniority, authority, connectedness, and just structure um, to that, that help kind of define this, uh, this community manager and the system that they're in and their effectiveness. So this is our logic model. Um, this, is, this is kind of the, our work plan laid out in graphic, just gra graphics. What we're starting with is an iterative development of the list of core competencies, skills, and activities that uh, community managers, um, science community managers, are asked to um, have based on job descriptions. And uh, basically we're gleaning job descriptions from across the internet that have to do with um, program management, com communications management, or anything that relates to this role um, that as we see it in order to develop a, basically a, a skills wheel um, that, that would define the broad um, world of a science community manager, again, from all the way from someone who really kind of focuses more on communications to someone who is really deep into the collaboration and, and everything in between. So that then we can use this kind of um, robusted, <laughs> I made that word up now, um, uh, this model that we've tried to be, make pretty robust um, to then create kind of portfolios of weighted uh, categories that describe not only the job descriptions of the CEFP fellows, but also the, their activities as, as defined by um, time tracking over the course of a specific amount of time so we can start to understand, given this broad range of skills that um, community managers are expected to have, within this, within this cohort, which of those skills have been asked for in their job descriptions, and then which of those skills are actually being employed? to kind of get a sense of the, the, the dissonance there. Um, at the same time, we'll be mapping the organizational and institutional structures through um, asking for org charts and, uh, and narratives. And in order to basically come up with some sort of model or taxonomy of community engagement managers and, and hopefully connect that with um, their effectiveness. So again, we started with uh, developing a, a, a skills wheel based on uh, both self-reflection and group reflection within our project team. Um, and then analysis of job descriptions and role statements, um, for, again, from across the internet. And then uh, review, we're going to be reviewing organizational structures um, as a second step, we haven't gotten there yet. Um, and we have been able to develop a preliminary skills wheel that is grouped into five core competencies, similar to the community roundtable skills wheel that Lou presented. Um, and I'm going to show you that in a, or show you kind of a mock-up of that in a second. But what we have def we found is it's a very iterative process because, of course, we all have different understandings of these terms, you know, business development or content management or, you know, all these terms obviously have a lot of different definitions. So we've been 
iterating just as a, as a group, as a five person group on what do these skills actually mean? What do, what do we do? Um, and so as a side kind of deliverable, we've developed a, a skills glossary, which we're hoping will be useful um, in further conversation about community management within science communities. And, you know, leading to this kind of coding protocol so we can start, we can take our own, we've been using this, this, this internet pile of, of job descriptions as a training set, basically. We're going to finally, now that we've, we're starting to finalize a skills wheel, we'll use that as a coding protocol to score our own um, uh, job descriptions. Of course, we're not going to score our own, but we're going to score each other's. So if you, again, remember the, um, the community roundtable skills wheel that Lou mentioned, it was broken up into five core competencies of engagement, strategic, business, content, and technical. And in, in general, what we've found so far is that there are similar um, breakouts with science community managers, but there's some differences in, in the, the uh, terminology. So program development and program management are really what we're focusing on uh, rather than strategy and business. And there's the very real ask in these job descriptions of subject matter expertise. And I'm, I'm personally really interested to find out, are we going to see, in, in when people start to map their activities, if this subject matter expertise is utilized for gaining trust within the science community and or for doing actual science. Um, I know for myself that I don't get to do as much science as I used to, even though I was asked to have subject matter expertise when I applied for the job. Uh, so again, as now that we've been scoring this training set of job descriptions, we're going to dive into scoring our own. Um, we will avoid scoring um, our own personally, obviously, uh, and then we'll do a sensitivity analysis and and kind of really try to dial in a, a pretty robust sense of a skills wheel as well as skills portfolios, which, which is that kind of weighted um, based on importance for each of us and then across the cohort. So, and this is my last slide. Um, these are the next kind of in broad, the, broadly the next steps that we plan on taking. Of course, it's July and we're gonna be done in December. So we're gonna be super productive. Um, we finalized this skills wheel based on this training set and then as based on our own um, uh, job descriptions, finalize the glossary. We're developing these weighted portfolios, both of the skills that are requested and then the activities that we actually do. Um, we will be analyzing org charts as, as well as narratives that, that describe uh, authority, responsibility, and seniority, as well as connective, connectedness to develop, again, a model or taxonomy of community engagement manager skills and responsibilities and context. And then really hoping that we're, we're, we're contributing to this understanding of people in this role. What, what are we um, asked to do? What are we actually doing and is it useful and how can we make it more useful and specifically around cultural change because in so many of these cases to get communities to work together, you have to change the culture. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's where we're at and I and that's uh, that's all I have and I would love to take questions. This is Christine. Um, I was waiting. I don't want to um, take up too much of the oxygen in the room. So if others want to say something, please. Uh, I wanted them to go first. However, I do have one thing. Um, again, really interesting uh, what you guys are doing. And I love the methodical approach. And uh, it, it seems really similar to what we uh, did in the in the workshop at this year's Science of Team Science Conference. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, for, for kind of identifying what we're, what is it that we have in common? What do we need? Um, and I just wanted to react to one thing and offer a, an additional thought. Um, the way that when you were talking about uh, something I'm also sharing your interest in, whether the subject matter expertise that is required for being a community leader in the context that you're talking about, um, the way that you presented it, it might have just been the language because of shorthand of this presentation, but I, what I heard was that you were curious whether they require this or 
utilize uh, this expertise either for um, gaining trust or for doing science. And I just wanted to propose that I think that there's a middle ground there um, where you might not be doing, and, and the reason I think this is because that's what my experience is, is that I'm doing less of my original uh, science that I came from, but I retain the subject matter expertise and I still guide some of that science. And I would say that the science I'm still, quote, you know, doing, not just sort of being legitimized in conversation with other people that do science, is more toward what Gabrielle has named as um, integration and implementation sciences. So maybe I'm doing, um, you know, I'm using my SME status, but to still synthesize knowledge, not only to uh, either gain trust of scientists or do the original science, but actually do some sort of synthetic middle ground science. I don't know if that um, uh, resonates with anybody else, but it's just I heard maybe there's more of a spectrum than a dichotomy was my thought. Awesome. Yes. And I, you, um, thank you. The, 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 I, I think the shorthand did kind of suggest that there was a dichotomy. I was saying a dichotomy, but I certainly didn't mean that. However, your point about um, um, about this other possibility—not only that you are that that you are both gaining trust and doing science, like there's an and there, but then this is other space where maybe uh, community managers in science communities actually get to do this other integration and implementation science, like you're shifting away from your specific discipline towards this broader discipline in, in while you're part of this, as you become part of, you know, as you take on this role is really interesting for me to think about. So does that, is that what you meant? Is that, um, and oftentimes this kind of evolution into this role would mean that you step away from your disciplinarity and, and, and more towards this inner, the, the, um, Gabrielle Bammer's work. Yeah, basically. And I'm finding cool. out that that's what I meant by writing a proposal right now where I, <laughs> am, I was figuring out how to how to say the part that I'm doing. So, and, it, and then I, it hit me that we're in this context studying how I should frame that. I should just say I am the integration and implementation scientist, um, irrespective of the fact that they aren't looking for one or know that that is a thing yet. But um, <laughs> But it, it struck me that if I'm just honest about what we're doing, it requires liter fluency in the home the subject matter expertise, but it's just a flipping of concept for me to say, instead of things I'm not, I actually am a, a different thing. And I think that's in many different roles and applications, what we're doing in these various uh, things we talk about here is just you know, it, it's not a negative space, it's a positive space, right? But how do yeah. we um, define it? So anyway. Yeah, and, thank you. And so, yeah, this is Lou again, to sort of murky the waters a little bit and, and sort of continue on, on these thoughts. I learned of a really interesting model a couple of weeks ago, um, which talks not of a skills wheel, but a skills web. So something that we often encounter in these roles is uh, we were talking a lot in our media meeting, for example, about how, you know, when the fellows take things like uh, personality uh, tests, they find that they don't typically fall at, at one end or the other. So they're neither extrovert nor introvert. They, they often have, wear both hats in the course of their role or they're not detail oriented or big picture oriented. They do both. In, in the course of their role. And so there's an interesting skills web which really pulls together all of these, these sort of almost opposite skills or skills at, at each end of a, a particular spectrum and says that the, the people that carry out these, these kind of synthesis, integration, collaborative roles are able to hold those skills in tension, which was a language I really liked, you know, literally this web where if you, you know, imagine all the strands, the strands are all been, being held there in tension because it's, it's not either or, it's, it's everything there held together. I, I just, I really liked that as a, as a sort of metaphor, as a, a very visual way of, of thinking about what we do. And also with that being positive again, um, you know, alluding to that sense that it's it, it's it's creating the the space, the construct to be able to to hold all of these things. It's it's not not doing something. 
I really like that. Um, and I wonder, Lou, is that a presentation that you might have access to say send to the um, in yeah, it's a, it's a blog post that I put on my blog. So if you look up social in silico, uh, it's, it's a post on it. But I can certainly share it afterwards as well. I can point you to it. Thank you. I think the, the other thing I wanted to say just in general about, about what we're calling community engagement, but again, lots of different words for this, is that it feels like there are various people thinking about the, this, this role, these kinds of functions from different perspectives and, and therefore with different languages, you know, their own individual glossaries for, for how they refer to, to what they do. And, and one of the things I'm particularly interested in at the moment is, is getting a sense of that landscape as well. So you know, I went to a net weaving workshop a couple of weeks ago. Turns out a net weaver is basically a community manager. <laughs> Who knew? Uh, but this is just something that is, is used as a term in the, the STEM education space. Uh, and so I think that as, as we and, and others uh, within our networks are, are thinking about you know, working in this space, it would probably make some sense to, to think about how we can be collaborative and, and even whether there is a, a common language that we can have for, for what we do because you know, together we're stronger sort of sharing, sharing these ideas and sharing these concepts. I totally agree. One thought I have, and I'm sure you guys are covering this as well through the um, the AAAS or for, through the uh, fellowship trellis community, is whether it might make sense to have a glossary, uh, just a, a small list of terms. Anytime we can, you know, take those types of things and cross post them on the Interreach website, so that we kind of highlight one another and um, don't work in divergent directions, but just, as you say, kind of help each other figure out where we have things in common. Um, that might be excellent. Yeah, that makes sense. Definitely beginning of conversations. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you very much to, for everyone for joining. I'm, I'm impressed that everybody stuck it out for an hour and 20 minutes. So we're, mm -hmm. we're grateful for your, your listening. And, um, you know, if anybody has any subsequent thoughts, I know there's a lot to take in here, you know, not just the program structure and the, the survey results and then what we're doing down on this project team level as well. And both Jen and I are, are very happy to, to chat with you and you can get in touch with us via uh, email. Uh, absolutely. Well, Jen, and, oh, go ahead. Uh, Jen and Lou, I just want to thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, since you did mention it, uh, should I go ahead and repost your contact information on the listserv so that people could contact you if you wanted more information? Uh, we can do it at the same time we post the link to the presentation. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Me too. Yeah, absolutely. All righty then. Thanks again. Thank you so much. Have a good rest of the day, everyone.